His one and only son to save For God so loved the world that he gave us His one and only son to save us Whoever believes in him will live forever The power of hell forever defeated Now it is well Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to York Community Church. It is great to see you all here today. My name is Vanessa, and I'm going to be leading us through today's service. Um, I'm going to explain in a minute exactly what's going to happen, because we're trying out a slightly different service today based around taking communion all together as a family. But before I do that, I'm going to read a verse, and we're going to sing, because what a good way to start our time together. Um. I really had on my heart for today the beautiful invitation in Isaiah 55 that God gives to us. I'm sure many of you know it already, but I'd love to read it again, as I think that is what God is saying to us today as we meet together. Listen to these words. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what what is good and you will find delight, the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I just sense that's God's invitation for us as we gather together as a family today. He's inviting us to come into his presence, to come without needing to prove anything, without needing to buy anything. His love is a free gift, and that is his invitation to us today. So before we go any further, we're going to pray and we're going to sing, and then I'll talk us through a bit more of how today's going to work. So let's pray together. Yeah, Father God, we thank you so much for this morning and thank you for this safe protected space where we get to come into your presence and meet with you and enjoy being together as well 
thank you that you say we're like living stones gathered together and we want to spark off each other as we meet together today. And we say, Holy Spirit, you are so welcome here. Come and have your way. Come and do what you know best to do. You know our hearts. So we give you freedom to move. We are longing to meet with you. And thank you that your love is a free gift. We don't need to prove anything. We don't need to buy anything. You invite us simply to come. However we're feeling this morning, come into your presence. So have your way, Father God. Amen. Wonderful. So I'm going to hand over to Rach and Stephen and the band, and we will sing one song together. Do you want to stand up and sing with us? Father God, we thank you so much that that is your invitation to us today. You're saying, come and drink, but you're also saying, come out of the grave. That calling that you gave to Lazarus when you were working on this earth, God is the same today. Step out of the grave. Let the grave clothes fall off and come into my presence. Amen. Amazing. Thanks, Bant. Please take your seats. Um, 
And I'd love to explain a little bit more of how this morning is going to work. So, as I alluded to, um, first thing, we're going to do a little slightly different structured service today. And it is all based around taking communion together. If you're new to YCC, let me um, share with you that we love to take communion together as family once a month. That is like a rhythm that we really guard and protect. And we thought we'd try something a little bit different for the next few months. We're going to, instead of taking communion in addition to the normal service, we're going to actually base the whole of the service once a month around communion, around the sacrifice that Jesus paid for us, and unpacking exactly what that means. So we're going to try that for the first time today. A lot of stuff is still happening as normal. We have kids' work, and they will leave um, in just a moment. Um, but for the rest of us, we'll stay in the room, and we won't just have one sermon. We're going to split up the teaching around the acts of taking communion together and enjoying worshiping God as response to that. So, a little bit different. And do share with us your feedback um, on how that works for you as well. We hope our heart as leaders is that this slightly different structure helps us draw on and reflect on the, the, the wonderful stuff that God is saying to us as a church through this meal. So, yeah, let us know what you think. And just a few notices to share with you as a family before we let the kids go out. Um, as I've said, Kairos is meeting today. That is our provision for primary school age children and younger. We've got a crush upstairs and we've got kids work. Um, so again, parents, please take your children outside to be registered under the Kairos team for sporting these beautiful Grecian spa colored t-shirts. Um, we'll take them from there and they will enjoy um, the rest of the session there together. As I said last week, T412 is our youth work provision on a Sunday morning. I um, suddenly got ahead of myself and I said it was going to start this week. That's not quite true. It's going to start next week. Today we've got a meeting for the leaders of T412 after the service. So there's a quick shout out. If you're somebody who's involved in Sunday morning youth work or you're going to be, you know who you are, and um, we're going to gather together just after the service. So huddle around me outside or something like that, and we'll find each other. Um, and generally, I really felt just to say, we're a church that really believes in like whole body ministry. You come and you receive and you let God speak to you, and you give and pour out as part of that. It's like a, yeah, a beautiful model of discipleship. And so actually, if you're interested in serving in some way of getting involved in church, just speak to one of the leaders, speak to me, speak to Simon, one of the leaders that, that you may get to know, um, we would love to encourage that culture in church. And um, especially as we emerge from COVID, we're sort of re-establishing lots of stuff. And we need, we need teams to help. And that's the other thing that I'd just love us to pray for quickly is the general re-establishing that is happening. As we prayed last week, it was the start of a new school year. And I hope this week has gone well for those of you in education. But as a church, we're seeing in this season, we're getting able to re-establish things. So we're making use of Cornerstone. It's a building that we'll talk about in a little building in a bit. We do lots of our outreach from there. Um, but also small groups are starting again, prayer opportunities, and um, outreach opportunities are starting this week as well. So I thought it'd be good just to pray generally over that um, as we do that together. And wisdom and grace and protection as we still navigate COVID. Um, it's great that we've got more freedom, but it's not gone away, have it? So we just want to pray and ask for God's help in that. So why don't you join me and we'll pray together quickly now. Yeah, Father God, we thank you so much that we get to be a part of church. Thank you that it's your design for us to be together. We weren't made to do life on our own. We need each other. How much has this last 18 months taught us that, God? We need each other. We need togetherness, and I think physical togetherness as well. And I thank you that in this season, as we emerge from pandemic, we're able to do a little bit more. But God, we pray for your wisdom and your protection as we continue to navigate through this season. It is still tricky, and we need you so much. So would you continue to lead us on? I think about that beautiful promise in your word, Psalm 119, that says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God, you show me the way. And I pray, actually, that is how we move with you 
in this season. Yeah, we dream and we make plans and we start to breathe again, but we're keeping that reliance upon you. So help us as we reestablish some ministries, as we settle into new school years, um, different work arrangements, God. Be with us in all that and lead us on as a church. Amen. Wonderful. So one more thing before we let Kairos go out. Um, you will have heard me mention Cornerstone. And again, many of you know what that is, but just in case you don't know, Cornerstone is the other building that YCC is really involved in. So we meet here on a Sunday morning and we rent this beautiful space. But Cornerstone is um, a building just up the road, just up Tang Ho Lane, that was formerly St. George's Methodist Church. And we've been doing quite a lot of outreach there in the last few years. <laughs> To be honest, YCC has always used it. The Methodists have been so gracious to us. Um, and as many of you know, we've been started a journey of trying to purchase that building. Um, it's a beautifully gracious God kingdom story, and I'll tell you much more about it. But we recognize that we're at a tricky point in that journey and purchasing the building whilst we want that to happen on a local level is getting a little bit stuck. So we want to pray for that. And I'm going to invite Simon to come up and lead us as a church as we pray for that. Yeah, so ever since our um, offer was accepted, we had a weekly prayer meeting for Cornerstone. Cornerstone Envisioning, and we used to meet at 6 o'clock on a Sunday on Zoom. Remember those days? And, um, and then we took a break at August because you know, we were coming out of lockdown in, in many ways, and August a lot of us were away and involved in other ministries. I am reluctant to relaunch... <laughs> a Zoom prayer meeting at 6 o'clock on, on a Sunday evening because I think after 18 months we've grown a little tired of that and to get us out in person. So this is the biggest gathering of YCC. So morning church, we're going to pray for Cornerstone. And uh, I'm going to invite you to stand in a moment and pray. We're going to pray a prayer of agreement, Matthew 18, you know, where, where two or three gather in my name and what they say, things are released and bound and loose, and we need some things loosing uh, over uh, the, the, the journey of purchase. So I'm going to pray a prayer, and if you want to join in, you can pray it back at me, very Argentine style. I learned that a number of years ago when I was there. Um, and really, I don't want to drown you in information. I want us to pray. Simply, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've prayed and discerned, we've put in the offer, we've given money, we've, we've made commitments, we are convinced this is the path, um, we just need some movement. We've hit a bit, and I have to be sensitive, a bit of a tricky situation. We knew there were things we needed to do to the building to get it up to speed. Um, COVID means that there are other things we need to do to make it a little more safe and user-friendly, and we're stuck because we haven't actually purchased it, so we can't physically go in there and do stuff. We're, we're reluctant to spend even more money than we've already spent on, on the building since our partnership with the Methodists. And, of course, the Methodists, God bless them, they have scores and scores of other buildings that they need to be sorting out and dealing with, and therefore, in terms of priority. Um, so no comments, no judgments we need the purchase to move forward to completion so we can get on with the task yes Fa oh. thank you you seven people i'll work with seven let's stand up if you want to just echo back to me uh, feel free father god you lavish your love upon us we love you. We want to honor you. We want to be attentive to your spirit. We want to be known as followers of Jesus. We bring the whole Cornerstone project to you. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come. 
Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Millfield Lane, upon that wonderful building with its glorious spiritual history, release it into its new chapter. Amen. And just stand where you are. If there's a bit, I know there's chairs. Some of you are you know, on the end of... The visual thing, the prophetic symbolism on this is it's the priests. It, it, we're coming into the, a land of promise. There's so many things we're already doing in that building and there's so much more we want to do in that building. And it's as if... Do you know the, the narrative at the beginning of Joshua, the book of Joshua, where the priests, the Levites, and where royal priesthood, where all priesthood of believers, they, they step into the flooded Jordan and the water parts. So if there's any space around you, I just want to make a step and say, Lord, release the purchase, okay? Release the purchase. Got any more room? Release the purchase. Release the purchase in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Simon. So it's now time for our Kairos age children to go. So if you want to head out following the leaders, as I've said before, if you're in secondary school, you'll stay with us today and enjoy communion with us. And T for 12 is back next week. Oh, wonderful. So, Father God, we thank you so much for all of these wonderful primary school age children. We pray your blessing on their time together. God, that they have so much fun now and they enjoy meeting with each other and with you. Yeah, would you have your way with this part of our church? Amen. So, as I said at the beginning, we're, we're going to try dotting everything up a little bit more this week. And Tom is about to come and share with us a little bit more as we prepare our hearts for taking communion together. So I'd love to pray for him and pray for us um, as we start this. Yeah, let's pray. Father God. We thank you for that invitation we heard right at the beginning, that you are inviting us to come into your presence and that we do not need to buy, to prove anything. It's a free gift, your love. And this meal is as well very costly to you, but a free gift to us. And so actually as we have this space to prepare our hearts to take it together and then to respond God, would you have your way with us and reveal new things to us? Yeah, we pray that you prepare our hearts now for these words like seed that are going to fall. And would you bless Tom as he shares, yeah, give him sensitivity to your spirit and peace and confidence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So Tom, if you want to go for part one. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to reassure anyone, if, if when Vanessa said right at the start that there's going to be more than one sermon, if you've already started to plan your escape route out of the fire doors, please rest assured that I'll only be preaching still for 20 minutes total. So th we have broken up the message, but we, I won't be preaching two 40-minute sermons. You'll be glad to hear. Um, I know some are disappointed, but there we go. Um, it's a joy and privilege always to be here, a real privilege to be sharing with you too. And as Vanessa said, um, in the lead up till Christmas, when we take communion together as a church, we are leaving a little bit more space. It might have been in the past that, you know, because of everything we fit in on a Sunday morning, we take communion and then we have a sermon, possibly on a different theme. And I think the church leaders are really feeling that let's honor this in the lead up to Christmas, Let's trial opening the whole service up to our communion table. So that's the idea. That's where we're headed today. Now, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that there are many themes and truths 
and amazing things that we can glean on from communion. And it's not my task today, thankfully, to cover them all. So Tom Candlin is leading communion in October in the next service. He might pick a different theme. I'm drawing out something specific for us today. Um, but there are, there's a whole range of different things we can learn from this ceremony. Now, I think um, for me, we all tend to approach communion through the lens of our own stories and our testimonies, our church background perhaps, and our experiences. So I thought I'd actually start by telling you a couple of stories from my own upbringing about communion. And the difficulty is sometimes it can be hard for us to see through those stories into the true biblical meaning and value of communion for us. So, uh, for example, I grew up in a Baptist church. Uh, I wasn't a Christian uh, for many of my teenage years. Um, and quite frankly, I was baffled by communion. Uh, in fact, the only thing I remember is that one Sunday, the minister had bought too much bread. So at the end of the service, there were still four loaves left over. It was like a pointless and uh, accidental version of the feeding of the 5,000 miracle. Um, so the youth group, we were called Back Row because we sat on the back row. It wasn't just a clever name. We came down the front and the minister said, can you please eat the rest of the bread? And we duly did. It was lovely. And the fact that that is the main thing that sticks out to me as a non-Christian in that church shows you how baffling it was to me. Even when I became a Christian, and, and even when I grew to love and value the cross of Jesus Christ, I still didn't really get it. I think the main problem was I grew up in a church much like this. Um, it was very informal. Uh, it w uh, we were very open, very expressive about our faith. And then it was a bit like when communion happened, the lights were dim, and we had to be very sombre and quiet. It didn't seem to quite fit with um, the kind of... the, th the, the um, the general feel of our services. So I didn't really, didn't really get it. In fact, it was only when I was outside of my normal church experience as a student here in York that the penny started to drop and I started to realise, wow, this has real power. I remember I went to St. Michael the Belfry as a student in the evenings um, and uh, an Anglican church. And on one particular occasion, I, was uh, I went to the, the church service and without giving you the details, I was desperately low. I was in a very bad place. In fact, I was so low that as the service started, it was an evening service, I was in tears for much of the, of the, af of the evening. And then they called us forward to take communion. And so I wasn't really used to this, but we all got into lines and had to go to the front. And as I went up, I was in tears because I was in real spiritual pain. And then the lovely lady beckoned me forward. And as she gave me the wine and the bread, she said, this is the blood and body of Christ to keep you in eternal life. And that word keep just broke me. I knew that communion was, was about God introducing us to eternal life through the cross, but it actually had the power to keep us to the end. And as I say, without explaining the full picture, my worries and my hurt at the time as a younger Christian was around, would I make it to the finish line? Would I make it to the end? So this, uh, this blood, this body of Christ, this uh, bread and wine have the power to keep us in eternal life. And for me, that's really exciting. Okay, um, I'm going to start by reading some scripture. If I could have the next slide, please, Sarah. Um, because I want to explain just how important this blood of Christ is. It's from Revelation, uh, uh, chapter 12. Revelation is a powerful, apocalyptic book. In my own view, it is describing uh, the end of the world and the mighty spiritual battle that takes place in heaven and on earth as God wraps things up um, to a close. And right in the middle of this account of the war that's going on, we read these words. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say... Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them day and night before God has been hurled down. They, that's the saints of God, triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from 
death. Do you see, whether we realize it or not, whether we like it or not, we as Christian believers are in a war. And our enemy, our opponent, Satan, here called the accuser, is bearing down on us. And it says here quite clearly that we overcome him, in part, through this blood, through this sacrifice. So that's why it's so important. And I was thinking about how do, I, how do we open this up for us today so that it's meaningful. And what was on my heart was to go back to Jesus and his disciples and the meal that they shared in the original case. You see, when they sat down uh, to share the bread and wine, yes, they were inaugurating a new Christian ceremony, but also they were commemorating an ancient Jewish festival, the festival of the Passover. And so I want to frame, as we approach the table today, I want to frame our worship in the story of the Passover. Many of you will be familiar with it, but I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour. In the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, we read how Israel, God's people, are being held as slaves. My mic. So Pharaoh, well I've got more volume as well, that's good. Pharaoh has enslaved the Israeli people, the Israelites. And God hears their cries for freedom. He hears their prayers. And he sends his prophet Moses to instruct the Pharaoh to release God's people. But Pharaoh refuses. He has a hard heart of hatred towards God's people and towards God. So God sends a series of terrifying and devastating plagues to break Pharaoh's will and persuade him to free the Israelites. This all culminates in the most horrific of all the plagues when God sends his angel of judgment and death across the land. And right in the heat of this saga, God instructs his people to take the blood of a lamb and plaster it on the door frames of their homes. Have the next slide, please, Sarah. Oh, there it is. Thank you. God, God is speaking here in Exodus 3. He says, The blood will be a sign for you, my people, on your houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So really, right here at, at the heart of the main redemptive narrative, of the whole story of Israel, right in the the center of the story, we find God's people sheltering under blood. And just like the disciples on the original night of the, the Passover, we are now sheltering under Jesus' blood. You see, this blood signifies freedom from judgment, freedom from all sorts of condemnation, And that's what we carry through with us into the communion ceremony. The New Testament even describes Jesus as our Passover lamb. So the the New Testament writers are definitely drawing that parallel. But to explain how this works, I want to return to Revelation. And the words I read earlier, it said, the saints of God triumph over the accuser by the blood of the lamb. So how exactly does... Jesus' death, his sacrifice for us, how does that relate to our victory over our enemies? Well, he's very deliberately called there the accuser. And it says that he accuses us day and night. So I want to ground this for a minute. Before God, day and night, God is accu- uh, Satan is accusing us. He's saying, you are a bad mum. You are an ineffective dad. You are a poor Christian. You are an unworthy witness at your workplace, day and night, day and night before God. And I don't know about you, but I can carry that sense of unworthiness, uncertainty around with me in my Christian life. And the real trouble is our conscience gets involved as well. We've been doing the Kintsuki course with our home group, and it talks about the inner critic. The person within us is accusing us as well. So we're thinking, "I I am not, I wish I was better. I don't know if I'm worthy even to take this communion. And Satan gets behind our conscience and simply amplifies it. So now we're walking around trying to be Christians, feeling doubly accused. 
that's the situation we find ourselves in often. And at this point, when we feel condemned, it's easy to play along with the devil's game, to kind of accept the premise of his, ar- of his argument and defend ourselves. So we might reason with ourselves and say, oh, yes, I did have a bad day today, but yesterday was a much better day. Or I've really, I've really mucked up there, but, uh, but, but um, yesterday I, had a really, you know, I did that thing for that person, so I'm not as bad as, uh, as you're saying. And as soon as you get into that argument, you're never going to win, because the truth is, in fact, it's, he's right. We, we are unworthy to be followers of Christ. And we're never going to be good enough for God. So, in a sense, we have to step out of that trap and divert Satan back to the blood of Christ. You see, that's where our value and acceptance before God lies. It's wholly in that. So just as when uh, God passed over Israel, it was, he saw the blood, spared judgment. It's the same with us. And if we send Satan back there, he has to flee. He's got no answer to that. We're talking about this in our home group, uh, and I hope she won't mind me uh, quoting her, but our friend Lindsay has worked uh, in politics on both a local and national level, and she drew this parallel. Often when you... I, I love you know, BBC uh, uh, politics programmes like Newsnight and Question Time, uh, and often you see these uh, MPs under, under a barrage of questions. And one of the techniques they use and that they're trained to use is to reject the premise of the question. So someone will say, why have you, as, uh, as the Minister for Education, let down uh, your voters? And instead of answering the question, the Minister will say, well, I, I reject the idea that I've let them down, and they go on. And in exactly the same way, we have to reject the premise of Satan's accusations. Because he's saying, you're not worthy to follow Christ. And the premise of that accusation is that some of us are. The premise is that you can be worthy. So instead of getting into that conversation with him or with your own conscience, say, actually, Satan, um, I'm not worthy, you're completely right, but I'm sheltering under the blood... And that's, can you go and have a conversation with God about it, please? Uh, And as I say, he has to flee, the argument's over, because, in fact, God has declared guilty people innocent on account of the cross. So, I said earlier, oh gosh, there's this sense that Satan's accusing us day and night. I can tell you this, if you're in Christ today, God's not listening to any one of those accusations. As far as God's concerned, you're kept by him, you're loved by him, you're accepted. And you never won't be. So yes, he's accusing us, but they're just falling on deaf ears. So when we take communion shortly, I don't want us to cower in fear or to feel uh, burdened in any way. I want us to eat this Passover in confidence and joy of knowing that there's no more condemnation for us. Uh, When I was a new Christian... I became a Christian quite dramatically, and I went home, I thought, I want, I want to read the Bible. I never want to read the Bible before. And the only Bible I could find in my house was this monstrosity. It's the Rainbow Good News. And if I open it here, it says, this was a- awarded to Thomas Marshall for 35 Sunday attendances at St. Luke's Maidstone. And I don't remember anything of it, so that was memorable. Um, actually, at the school where I work as a teacher, there's a, actually a whole shelf in the head teacher's office of pristine versions of this, a whole fleet of them, and they're utterly untouched. So if you're worried about the state of Christianity in British schools, your fears are well-founded. Um, but one of the remarkable things about this Bible was that if you open it up, someone, I don't know who he, who he or she was, has drawn pencil drawings to go with certain verses, and these have kind of remained imprinted on my mind as I've gone in my faith. And I want to bring one of them to you today. If we could have the next slide, please. This was alongside Romans 6 in the, in the text. And I love it, really, because the person comes up to the cross laden with a heavy burden. And in this context, that's not the worries or the cares of life, that's guilt. It's, it's that feeling of sinfulness and unworthiness before a holy God. But the person lays down the burden and walks away with their head 
held high, utterly free. And for me, that's what communion means. As soon as you've taken that bread and that wine and confessed, it's a time of confession, you might have things on your conscience that you want to bring to God, but he doesn't condemn you. You walk away like this. That's what should be happening. And the way we've set up communion uh, today, I'll explain in in detail shortly how we're going to do it. I want it to be worshipful and celebratory and not have us sat down, worried and chewed up and navel-gazing. Um, I've just got one more thing to share before we go into the ceremony, and it's an illustration I've, I've stolen from the Bible teacher, Don Carson, and he's talking about um, the Passover. And the point I want to make is, it doesn't matter if you're still feeling a bit unsure of what I've said today. Some of us may be feeling, if I've preached correctly, that, oh, great, rejoice, rejoice. There's no more condemnation for me. But others might still be unsure. And the truth is, it's the quality of the sacrifice that counts, not your faith in it. And Carson imagines the scene on the night of the original Passover. He says there's two Jewish men, and they're preparing their homes for the Passover. One man, one Jewish man, is, is ver- feeling very fearful. He knows what he has to do. He's putting his blood on the door but he's feeling scared because he's seen the other plagues. He's got a firstborn son, and he's feeling pretty het up about what's going to happen that night. The second Israelite believes the promises of God. He's putting the blood on his post. He's thinking, yeah, there's a plague coming, but I believe the promises of God. Hallelujah. Nothing's going to touch my house tonight. And then Carson simply asks the question, which of those men lost their firstborn son that night? And the answer is neither. Because it was the blood that counted. Not the quality of their faith, not how confident they were feeling. It was the quality of the sacrifice that was made that led to God passing over. So even as you approach the communion today, even if you still feel a bit, I still feel a bit unworthy, know that the power is in the blood. And that's how we overcome our accuser. Okay. Okay. I'd like to invite the band back up, please. I'm going to explain in in detail what we're going to do. But over the summer, my family and I put 1,400 miles on the clock of our car, driving up to Scotland and back. And our family all loved music, so the CD player was on the entire time. The only trouble was that we all had very different tastes in music. So you had to wait 100 miles before your own stuff came back on. So I'd, I'd listen to my Mark Knopfler CD. Uh, then I'd have to listen to Old MacDonald Had a Farm. That was four-year-old Jack's choice. Kids Praise, that was seven-year-old Phoebe's choice, so Kairos are doing a good job there. And my wife's choice, Rend Collective. And when it comes to Rend Collective, let's just say that I'd rather have Old MacDonald Had a Farm. <laughs> but... They have written one song which I really love. (laughs) And I want to read some lyrics to you now as we move towards communion from that song. These are the lyrics. It says, This is the art of celebration. It's knowing that we're free from condemnation. Oh, praise the one. Praise the one. (sighs) Who Who made sense? (laughs) <laughs> to all my sin. <sighs> so, 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 when we sing, when we sing, <sighs> Come on, we went to a grammar school here, let's sort this out. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel my masters bearing down on me. So when we sing at the back end of this communion table, Let's celebrate Christ. You be like that guy, heads held high. It doesn't matter how, what you've done, how bad you've lived. The blood is where your value lies. Right, I'm now going to have to transition to a very orderly description of what's going to go on. <laughs> so can I invite the servers, please, to come up? You know who you are. We are going to do things slightly differently because sometimes when we take communion, we're used to um, silence 
and, and we're not going to do that today. We're going to um, focus on music and use that as a vehicle a little bit more. But this is what's going to happen. In a moment, Stephen and the band are going to worship the Lord. Now, you're to remain seated so you can receive your bread and juice. But please do join in with, with the song. We'll bow your head and, and reflect on this amazing sacrifice that God has made. The guys will bring you both a bit of bread and some juice. You've got your own stuff because COVID's still around. So what you're to do is to hold that as you worship the Lord. When I'm confident that we all have all of the elements, condiments, what I want you to do is um, the band will fade. I'll pray. We'll take both the, the bread and the juice and then we'll stand and sing. Does that make sense? So it's a time for you and God. This is worship. So I'm going to pray again now. Stephen's going to lead. Stay seated. Receive your elements. And then when I've prayed again, we'll, we'll take the, the bread and the juice and we'll worship God. Okay? So let's pray. This is the art of celebration. Knowing we're free, free from condemnation. Praise the one, praise the one who made an end to all my sin. Father, we thank you for the power of the blood, for your broken body and shed blood for us. We don't deserve it, but we sure need it. And we thank you that this is all rooted in your love. As Becky was reminding us last week, for God so loved the world that he gave his most precious son. And your word says that you, Christ, were delivered up for our trans uh, transgressions and then raised to life for our justification. So we, we worship your name, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice. Amen. Let's go again. So I want to add, uh, Vanessa's rightly reminded me that this is a ceremony as well that is rooted in personal confession and faith. So if you're here today and you might be interested in Christianity or enjoy coming to church, but you don't feel that it means anything to you yet, then you don't have to feel uh, that, you, that, you, that you should take it. Thank you. You chose the cross with every breath, the perfect life, the perfect death. You chose the cross, the crown of thorns you wore for us, the crown us with eternal life. You chose the cross, though your soul was overwhelmed.
Father, for your amazing sacrifice, and we thank you that we can walk away with heads held high. And Father, thank you that when it comes to us, there's no uncertainty in your heart. You love us lavishly, and you see us as yours, you see us as accepted. We praise your name for that amazing sacrifice and for that amazing legacy. Um, amen. Okay. I invite you now to take um, the juice and bread. Stand and sing.
linger here for a moment. Lord, we thank you so much that your name is great and your heart is kind. That's the, the Matt Redmond song and I'm sure it's in scripture too, but Lord, we, we, th- we thank you so much that you are great and kind together and we want to lift your name up in that spirit, Father God. Amen. Psalm 102, thanks, Ellie. Take a seat, everybody. We are going to worship again shortly. Before we do, I just want to say that my wife, Emma, is a beautiful gift in my life. And one of the functions that the poor woman has to perform is to stop me making a fool of myself. So in the last five minutes, I almost took the juice and bread when I sat down, having described to everybody else what we should be doing. And then I also sang without my mask on, but she was on my shoulder keeping me honest. Thank you, Emma. Before we finish this morning, I want to issue you with another challenge. I've intentionally left some space at the end of the service. Ness is going to come up and lead us in a response. Because I want to just raise the question, really, of whether we're walking in freedom with Christ. If we read on in the Passover story in Exodus, I'm sure you don't need me to remind you that... um, 
after the last terrifying plague had gone, Pharaoh agreed to let the people go. That very night, they packed up their lives and, and, and left Egypt. But they came up against the Red Sea. So they're kind of marooned in the land of slavery. To make matters worse, Pharaoh, like the reasonable chap he was, had changed his mind and was bearing down on them in chariots. So the people were trapped. And sometimes in our Christian lives, we can live in this in-between world where we know we're forgiven and accepted by God, but we're still living in slavery to some of the old habits from our former life. I know this is true because I lived like this for 10 years of my life. I was set free from the guilt and the condemnation of my teenage years, but I wasn't following the Lord and I was still giving in to every whim of the sin in my life. And we know what happens in the story. God dramatically intervenes. He parts the sea. They go down into the water and out into freedom. The sea closes and the Egyptian army is destroyed. And this imagery is mirrored in the New Testament in baptism. It was such a joy last week to see four young people underlining their commitment to Christ and being baptized. But as we saw them go into the water, we saw the same thing. Death in water into a new life of freedom. And I just want to say today that, that, that God wants you to be well and truly free. And he's got a new and a sparkling life of freedom for you. And the Apostle Paul writes these words. I've got it on the, um, on the PowerPoint, so we can have that back on. But it's from Galatians. It's slightly out of context. Paul is talking here about the law, about legalism, but it's still the same thing. God wants us free. And it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand then. And don't let yourself be burdened by a yoke of slavery again. And I love this verse because it's loaded with the word freedom. It's almost as if Paul can't say it enough. It's for freedom that you're free. You're free. You're free. You're really and truly free. And so I want to challenge you today that, yes, you're accepted. We're, we're forgiven. We belong to God. But if you still struggle and still struggle with addictions or habits that just get you down, God wants you to walk out into freedom. You are a new person. It says in the Bible that you died with Christ to your old life, and you now walk in newness of life. And the the Bible teacher, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, gives this illustration of a soldier who has been in the army, and perhaps he has a sergeant major who gives him lots of directions. You've got to do this. Stand up, sit down, line up, clean the floor. And the soldier has to do as the sergeant major says. And then the soldier decides that he's had enough of this and he wants to leave the army. So he, he signs off and he's walking and he, he's got his jeans on, well he's got his bag over his shoulder. He's walking off the parade ground out into a new life of freedom. And then round the corner comes the sergeant major. And he says, soldier. And the first reaction of this man is to stand to attention. But then he realises... He's free. It doesn't matter what the sergeant major says to him anymore. He's not under his authority. And that illustration that Lloyd-Jones uses is for our relationship with sin. Sin might still tell us to do things, to get back into those old habits, but we're actually free. We don't have to do it. It says in the Bible that this new life that we've been born into, that we actually become slaves to righteousness. It's like we want to do what God wants us to do. So there's the challenge. I'm going to hand over to Ness now and the band. And I just want to say again, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Don't hover on the shores of the Red Sea. Walk out into a new life. Let me just use this mic thing. Great. Um, Thank you so much, Tom. And we're just, as we said, we're going to worship again. Um, resting again, but I just want to encourage you. This is a space, and we have precious protected space to listen to the voice of God. And for the verse in Isaiah at the beginning said, "Listen to me, that you may live." And that was the encouragement I send. We find our life by listening to the voice of God. So let's stand up and we'll sing a bit more and we'll see what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us, but let's continue to tune our ears to his voice. Thank you, band. I've heard a thousand 
stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that just want to, we're nearly done, but we don't want to miss anything that God is doing right here, right now. And um, yeah, Simon and I both, both sense the Holy Spirit saying something around that invitation to freedom that, that Tom outlined, that there is an invitation into greater freedom, new freedom. I even have the phrase new season for some of you. Um, and we don't want to miss that. We want to seal that and we want to someone to make a commitment before God today if that's something that you sense as well. Um, and, and as well as that, I think there's a second thing that Simon's been carrying. Um, there's the invitation to new freedom and there's the, 
the new season there. But there's also something about shaking off something of anxiety of this season. So we want to do both. Um, Simon, do you want to pray for the anxiety stuff first? And then I'll pray for the new season stuff. So just as we were worshipping, I, I, I was led to the verse, Psalm 3, where it talks about, I lie down and sleep, and all night long the Lord protects me. And this walking in freedom is, is good when the sun's shining or I'm with my friends. And I just felt maybe some of us um, were struggling with sleep, maybe for different reasons, but maybe for some of it, it's, it's anxiety linked. It's, it's, it's some sort of dread concerning when the sun rises and the next morning. And I just want to claim that promise. The Lord will protect you in your sleep. And then the next psalm over in Psalm 5, it talks about uh, how my prayer rises to you as the sun rises upon my life. Father God, if there's any in this room who are struggling to sleep, give them your peace. Quieten their spirits at night that they may be kept in your presence until the physical sun rises again. And may their first words be words of thanksgiving and delight. Just receive that. You think, is that me? Is that me? If you're thinking about it, it probably is. His peace through the darkness of the night, his rest, totally refreshing your mind until you rise in the light of new beginnings. Thank you, Lord. That's good. And then there's just one thing about that new season. So again, if, it, if, if that is you, if you sense uh, Holy Spirit conviction that, that this is this next season is a new one. There's greater freedom available for you. Um, yeah, we just want to pray into that and seal that. God, thank you that you are always transforming us. You are taking us from glory to glory. And thank you that you say in Isaiah, see, I am doing a new thing. Don't you perceive it? And actually, as we emerge from this pandemic season, I think there is new things for us as a church, but us as individuals as well fresh bread. So, Father God, we want to just say yes simply to, to everything you have for us because your works are wonderful. Your ways are completely good and we trust you. We say that today as a family. We trust you. So, yes to the new things you have for us. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody. We're, we're just out of time there. Um, don't want to stop anything that God is doing. If you want more prayer, please ask the person next to you or I'll come to somebody who's seen at the front um, and we'd love to pray with you. Refreshments are going to be served from the back of the hall and we're going to take them outside into the car park. And if you came uh, with a child who's been in care of us, please could you go up and collect them just now and... Um, Thank you, that'd be amazing. It's been so good to worship with you all today and we, um, we look forward to seeing you next week or through the week. Um, and again, if you have any questions about church or any other ways we do things, please come speak to us. Thank you.